Hi everyone, Sean Hackett here. I'm just going to go through the competency framework draft that we have been developing over the last three years nearly at Orange Medical Transport here in Ontario. Um, this work came about uh, as a need. We were redesigning the critical care paramedic program um, in order to meet the various needs of uh, today and in our design we had a scaffolding model um, we used primarily social constructivism in a social online learning environment didactically um, with mentors in person in simulation and in residency and what we found that in our scaffolding that when we started combining knowledge skills and attitudes together into performances we were having trouble communicating the definition of what it was that we wanted to observe and give feedback on. And essentially this led us into the work, um, really starting back in 2019, of entrustable professional activities and competencies. Now we're still learning a lot about this, but um, we have been um, studying this. We have been doing a lot of literature review. We have um, many times had working groups. We've had uh, subject matter experts, uh, physicians, frontline paramedics, educators get together and discuss um, those things that are a critical care paramedic, the activities we observe, what um, proficiencies we expect, what thresholds of performance we want to see. And we've trialed it. We've had an alpha version of our critical care paramedic program run very successfully um, we are in um, the beta version right now and we are past the halfway mark and it's going um, overwhelmingly well um, but we are still in the process of, of refining and validating what we have determined are those actions that we want to see the paramedics do and to what threshold we want to see them do them in order for those paramedics to be deemed proficient and uh, trusted when they go out for independent practice. Now, we have a long history at Orange of very successful, high-performing critical care paramedics using previous versions of um, and methodologies of teaching. Um, and our initial certification entry to practice testing has maintained the same. And um, we're happy to report that uh, we are having great success with um, our students going for that testing. So we're still learning and we um, are still developing this but um, I'm confident that we're on the right track that what we have been learning and we have been doing is great and um, if you're watching this video it's really because we need your help to better refine and define that work that we're doing and the more eyes and the more minds that we have looking at this the better. So. Uh, what you're looking at right now is um, a spreadsheet which essentially is where we're drafting our competency framework. We have been um, in different versions since 2019. Um, to start off here in the top left, at Orange we um, designed our program as a postgraduate program with five semesters. And those five semesters align with a particular um, learning objectives and performance outcomes that we want to see as they scaffold through the program and so our milestones are aligned with those so it's not to say that um, you have to use these where you are um, you don't have to use the same education design you don't have to use the same uh, milestones um, you don't have to even determine the same thresholds what we're interested in is is the, the observable activities that you see a critical care paramedic do, what are all inclusive of those activities? Um, and then we can worry about um, thresholds and, um, and which ones um, do we want to trust paramedics with in our different jurisdictions later on. Right now we're really concerned with um, this uh, section D, which is our contributing performances, our observable activities. Just to walk through this document a little bit more, uh, next to the top left there, where we have our different uh, residencies defined, uh, we have column B, um, which is a title of our thresholds, and C, uh, just the subtitle of our thresholds. So not assessed as a level zero, 
explores a level one trial level two for example and then we have our definitions which uh, were also debated and uh, rooted in some literature not a lot of literature on this but um, there is definitely some um, correlation to performance that we see and to the scaffolding model that we created in our design so when you look at this um, you can you can give us feedback on these definitions um, we've thought about these definitions quite a bit if you look further right you can see uh, we defined these three terms review analyze and interpret so when you're going through these thresholds and this is when you're observing a paramedic do an action um, to what level are you observing them perform and level zero is they just didn't perform it or they don't have the ability to uh, level one is that um, they can discuss this with you or they can write a test on it but uh, actually performing it is not something that uh, they can do they essentially have a, a knowledge of it level two is now they are able to perform it in a very common um, linear fashion um, where there's somebody is, is outlining it for them and saying okay you're going to intubate this patient uh, and I'm going to be here with you and uh, and you go through that uh, intubation and are coached through it in a very straightforward manner um, level three then is uh, you can do that independently I don't need to watch you do that intubation as long as it's a common context and there's no surprises, then you can perform that uh, intubation. Um, and uh, if you need to, you can call a friend or you can rely on a teammate to help you. Level four is full autonomy. You are reliable in this skill. Um, you can manage uh, those surprises. You can uh, do this in non-contextual situations, um, things that you didn't practice. Um, but are, you're now requiring to do an intubation in this situation, you're able to do it. Level five is that you're able to teach it. Um, your proficiency is such that you can coach others to become more proficient. And level six is a level of mastery, meaning uh, essentially that you could put this down and walk away and come back in a number of years and still be proficient at it because you've um, developed that ability to a certain proficiency that um, your degradation is very slow. Um, within these definitions as well, and you'll see in the terminology of those actions, the words review, analyze, and interpret. And so um, level two, where you have a coach walking you through it, um, that would be consistent also with the review. So if you were looking at a diagnostic, an ECG, a diagnostic image, a lab, and you have knowledge of this and you can look at it and understand uh, the terminology and the framework and you can have a discussion about that you're at the review level of that if um, you're able to take that and um, derive some meaning from it and have a meaningful discussion with an expert about it um, looking at an x-ray uh, looking at an ECG and talking to someone else who also knows about those things and being able to have that professional conversation, you're at the analyze level. And if you're able to uh, look at that uh, x-ray or that ECG or that uh, lab result and you're able to independently interpret the meaning of that um, where you don't need the reliance of a friend, you might want to call an expert for the benefit, but it's, it's not necessary for you to make a treatment decision, you're at level four that's an interpretation and that's important to distinguish where we um, are setting our thresholds of expectation so for example at Orange um, we expect an interpretation of a chest x-ray because um, the critical care paramedics at Orange heavy, heavily rely on x-ray interpretation of the chest in order to make independent clinical decisions so we have to teach and assess to that performance level of interpret but when it comes to um, a long bone fracture or a pelvic x-ray, um, we would expect them to recognize what they see, recognize the structures, um, know what they're looking at, and obviously be able to talk to someone about that and say, this is what I'm looking at, this is what I see. And so really at the analyze level, I'm not gonna make a diagnosis on that. I'm just gonna um, uh, analyze this and talk to somebody about it and be accurate in that description. Um, and this comes into play too with uh, us expanding to ultrasound at Orange 
where right now our expectations really are just a level one and soon they'll be to a level two where they're going to be doing this uh, in a skill-based station where they can take an ultrasound with a coach and be told here's a straightforward case that you're looking at and let's go through that together and that's level two so that would be we're, we're going to be working our way up to the review stage of ultrasound at Orange as an example. So that's our thresholds, that's our, our descriptions for that. And then we spent a number of years looking at and refining these contributing performances. And so essentially what that is, is, is um, in our initial education program, we have approximately 1,500 learning objectives. Easily could be 3,000 if we went to more minutia. Um, we could pull that back and make it 700 learning objectives if we were very broad. But we described them out into 1,500 learning objectives um, for our educational needs. And we combine those knowledge, skills, and attitudes together into an action, a performance. So for example, um, um, can, I'll scroll down to one that's, that's um, recognizable for people. Um, ECG diagnostics. So performing an ECG acquisition is, um, is an activity that we're going to observe and we're going to provide feedback on. And so it requires knowledge. They need to understand um, certain aspects of cardiology, electrophysiology. Um, they need to know the, the tool. They need to know how to apply the uh, electrodes in the proper positioning. They need to be actually be able to physically do that, um, dry the skin, shave the chest, whatever is required. Um, and know when it's appropriate to do that. And so you would measure, you would assess their level of performance using those thresholds we described based on that PERFORM ECG acquisition. And then our expectation here is this target threshold is um, for a resident level one, um, at the end of their first residency, we expect them to be autonomous with that at the end of their first residency. And we will be filling these in um, more specifically for people to understand this is an ongoing work right now so um, and then uh, you know interpreting the rhythm is a is another thing um, interpreting access is another thing uh, requires all those other things as well so that's that's ECG that's a that's a um, an activity we can observe and then we have over here what we um, are looking at is our draft competency which is the ECG diagnostics which is how well are you doing something? And so this is the um, proficiency of the, of the critical care paramedic. Their ECG diagnostics is the proficiency. These are the actions that they're taking um, that are contributing performances to this, um, this attribute of being a diagnostician of ECGs, um, is that they can do all of these activities. And these are all things that have a beginning and an end it requires a critical care paramedic um, or, or other healthcare professionals can do ECGs obviously but you're not going to call a plumber to do this um, and so it's critical care paramedic it integrates knowledge skills and attitudes it has a beginning and an end I can observe it I can provide feedback and I can say based on this I can give you a threshold how well you performed that and so that essentially is um, how we're defining at this stage our contributing performances. And as I scroll through you can see we have quite a list of them. A, uh, a lot of these things. Now understand it took years of meeting with paramedics, frontline paramedics, educators, subject matter experts, and having discussions about what are actually those things that you see a paramedic do in these situations. And then using the words to describe them, the semantics and the terminology of analyzing a head x-ray, something I would see them do, um, and then I could give them feedback on how well they did that. So that's, that's the, um, the section here. Red ones are ones that um, we're uh, still in debate over, uh, which is fine because we're going to be getting feedback from everyone on all of these things. So. Uh, this we have uh, for open viewing. This is research that we're doing. We're using this. We've put a lot of work into this. A lot of people at Orange have dedicated a lot of time and energy and emotion into uh, this work. And um, we are sharing it. We are planning on publishing it. 
but we are sharing it because it was so much work and it's important work and we want to be able to um, use the meaning behind this work which is to communicate with each other communicate with our students communicate with other health professions communicate with other paramedics what it is that a CCP is and does our framework here uh, is a clinical framework. We designed our program to go advanced care land to critical care paramedic. And so these are all based on clinical performances that we're educating to get them to entry level practice as a clinician. What we don't have in our framework are those activities that a critical care paramedic would do uh, in their profession throughout their career, which is leadership roles, management roles, educator roles. And so there are activities that you would see a CCP do, like uh, transport dangerous goods, transport oxygen, drive a vehicle. Um, you would see them, um, you know, fill out a, um, a checklist, um, make sure that um, they're stocking their equipment. These are activities that CCPs do, uh, including um, deliver videos, uh, teach a class, uh, all these kinds of things that are, are potential activities that CCPs do. Uh, are not captured in our list, but in a complete framework for a critical care paramedic would be captured or should be captured. There's, there's more depth to this as I go through. So each one of these, um, as, you, as you go across, we have our competency and we have those contributing factors. And this is the, the category that we're really looking at right now. We have our milestones of when we expect them to achieve what level and in this way it's competency-based education because um, at the end of their first semester we can look at the feedback that we've gotten um, on all those students and we can ask the students themselves um, where are the students at? Um, where are their faculty? Where are their facilitators? Where are their mentors? And where do they themselves see them um, at the end of semester one? And where did we deem they should be? And so then we can make those decisions about how much more education is required, where support needed, um, should they be moving on to the next semester, um, can they move on to the next semester and still work on some of those competencies they need to, to catch up, or should they spend more time in that semester. Um, these are all things that we can, we can use these milestones for. And then we have um, the categories of uh, objectives, which we have in a different spreadsheet, because I said there's 1,500 of them. And uh, so there's, there's um, the contributing objectives that go into each of these performances. Um, and we've also gone through the work of associating the current um, Paramedic Association of Canada National Occupational Profile um, definitions and associated which ones are associated with which performances. And as an example of that, um, why we had to develop our own, why we couldn't use those national occupational profiles. This one's a good example, ECG Diagnostics 2.5. When we did our needs assessment, we looked at what does a critical care paramedic need to do for our patient population? We looked at they need to be able to do these things. We need to see them do all of these things. The pink one, by the way, is, is, uh, refers to uh, pediatric education. Um, when you look at the NOCPs, there's 4.5M and 4.5N, and that's all that they have to describe ECG for uh, this competency uh, and these um, activities. So the other aspect of that is that 4.5M and 4.5N are the same for primary care, advanced care, and critical care paramedic in the current national profile. And that was insufficient for us. While, yes, we expect them to be able to put on an ECG and, and acquire it, um, our expectation of their interpretation and their performance with that is uh, to a level four, as we described here, with uh, autonomous differentiation of arrhythmias, um, autonomous identification of ECG changes associated with ischemia. These are things that we need to see so that when we show them an ECG, they can actually do those things. Um, interpret, uh, identify um, those things. So we, we have quite a bit here. Obstetrics is similar. Um, there's things that um, the current National Occupational Profile just did not 
do sufficiently for our education needs. So we needed to build our own framework to see what do we need to see them do um, for feedback to them and for our acknowledgement so that they can progress and be competent, confident critical care paramedics in the future. And as you go down the list here, you'll see there's like these little blackout ones here. And uh, 2.4 is an example. This is professionalism. And the reason that's here is that 2.6 lab diagnostics requires the competency of professionalism uh, as, part of, as part of its performance. And it requires these specific things, blood glucose determination, venous arterial blood sampling. Um, so we want to see these particular actions as a part of our lab diagnostics, but we also want to see that they have this um, competency of professionalism. And when you look at what that means is professionalism is these things, practicing aseptic technique, demonstrating self-care, demonstrating compassion, uh, maintaining patient privacy, demonstrating patient advocacy. So these things are the actions that we want to see a critical care paramedic take in order to be a professional, which in itself includes these competencies, communication, mindset, cultural competence, preparedness, and team dynamics. So if we look at ECG requires professionalism, that means ECG also requires communication, mindset, cultural competence, preparedness, and team dynamics, requires those things in order to do ECG diagnostics. You can say that's very convoluted, but um, it, it does make sense, and I can demonstrate that in a couple of ways. Uh, one is that um, when you're doing ECG acquisition, you want to make sure that they're doing aseptic technique with everything that they're doing with patients. And so rather than write aseptic technique in everywhere, uh, it's a part of that professionalism uh, competency, that attribute of being a professional, is that we need to see that, and then that needs to be part of everything that they do. Um, an example that I give our educators at Orange is that you observe a paramedic do a case in the hospital and the, the staff seems unsure, the communication is not going great, people seem trepidous, they're, they're helicoptering around the student um, and it's very uncomfortable. And at the end you're thinking about that and you're observing that and thinking about that and you're thinking, okay, what what was it that the paramedic was was doing or not doing that resulted in this discomfort and this um, this communication this environment and you can look at this exuding competence exuding competence for patients and stakeholders is this an entrustment is this an activity well as an activity exuding competence is something I, I can observe so it requires knowledge skills and attitude the knowledge is that they require knowledge of their environment, they require knowledge of their tools, they require knowledge of their uh, expectations and performance, they require the skills of being able to uh, bring their equipment in, set their equipment up. Um, they need the affective aspects of valuing their patients, valuing what the stakeholders want to hear from them, valuing what they're there for, uh, what their job is and, and what role they're fulfilling in that healthcare environment. And so I can observe that and I can say, you know what, there was discomfort. They did not have a lot of confidence in you because you were not exuding competence on that call. But when I look at that, this, this um, aspect of professionalism, I'm giving you feedback on your professionalism, and I'm really thinking about this exuding competence as an aspect of that. And what can we do? Well, these other competencies are part of that. And in this particular case, I can go back and I can look at um, preparedness. And I can say 2.2 preparedness. You know what? Your equipment wasn't ready. And you got a little bit behind on the call and were not able to actively listen. You weren't able to engage properly and exude that confidence to the stakeholders because you were busy scrambling to get your equipment set up, get things ready because it wasn't ready ahead of time. And that can happen, um, especially when we're surprised. But in this particular case, your equipment wasn't ready um, because we go back to communication. And you actively were not actively listening to your partner. Your partner was telling you when you got the case information, when you were on your way to this case, that 
this is this is things that I'm thinking it could be. But you were tunnel visioned on something else, and so you weren't listening to them. And so while they were telling you things, I wasn't seeing any action from you that was demonstrating that you were listening to them. In fact, I saw the opposite, because you didn't get any of the equipment prepared that you would have had you been listening to them. And then you got behind on the patient care and you were not exuding confidence and the staff lost confidence in you. And so it affected your professionalism. And so each of these things is a specific activity that I'm giving you feedback on, but they're related in that communication is a key part. Um, the active listening is a key part of preparing for your call with your partner. Actively being able to actively listen on the call means preparing ahead of time so that you can dedicate that time to listening. And then being on the call, exuding that confidence by saying, I'm ready for this, I'm listening to you, we have equipment ready, we can manage this, all would have gone differently had the communication with your partner been better. And so these things are all related, where we have competencies contributing to activities, and we have activities contributing to competencies. And we can discuss that at length uh, and debate it, and there's many different opinions on where those lines lie. But essentially for us at Orange, this is how we've structured this, and it makes sense for us, for our students, to be able to give them feedback and develop them. Because if you go through and you look down at um, something that you might all be familiar with, um, endotracheal intubation. So we want to observe a crash intubation. We want to observe a facilitated intubation. We want to observe a delayed sequence intubation and a rapid sequence intubation. Um, we want to observe um, mitigating difficulty with uh, intubation. We want to observe post-care intubation. And for us at Orange, we do pediatrics and neonates, so we have these uh, highlighted pink because they're particular course and particular thresholds for pediatric and neonatal intubation. And so these are all actions we want to see. But it includes these other competencies of professionalism, like I just described, and tidal CO2 interpretation, diagnostic imaging, that chest x-ray, history gathering, general clinical assessment, laryngoscopy as its own um, competency, which requires its own uh, activities. And this is the example I use. These, these, all of these competencies contribute to a critical care paramedic being able to do an endotracheal intubation. And we can go back and we can look at uh, 3.5 laryngoscopy. Sorry, our numbering system has to be updated. We, we added a couple of things, and so the numbers got off. But uh, 3.4 laryngoscopy. So laryngoscopy itself is, I want to observe a direct laryngoscopy. I want to observe a video laryngoscopy. I want a video suction-assisted laryngoscopy. I want to observe mitigating difficulties related to laryngoscopy. So laryngoscopy itself you could describe as a skill. And as a skill, that would be in a very straightforward situation that you can you can practice over and over and over again that that psychomotor maneuver of laryngoscopy as a psychomotor skill. But as an activity, laryngoscopy means in a context now of a patient who requires it, are you aware of the anatomy, you have knowledge of physiology, you have uh, knowledge of the tools, you have knowledge of your kit, um, you are making decisions, judgments, um, prioritizing, when do I do this? When do I make the decision to intubate? And then actually do that skill. So the difference between the psychomotor skill of laryngoscopy and the activity of laryngoscopy is that context. And so then the context is I want to observe direct laryngoscopy. Great. All of these performances tell me that as somebody who does laryngoscopy as a competence, is uh, the critical care paramedic has that competency of laryngoscopy because I observed them do these activities to a threshold of proficiency. They can do suction-assisted laryngoscopy, they can do it great, they're proficient, they're autonomous. Um, I have confidence in their ability to perform laryngoscopy. So this is, this is the, um, the proficiency of laryngoscopy, the competency. 
which contributes to endotracheal intubation. Endotracheal intubation also includes paralytics, analgesia, uh, sedation. Um, it includes the, the oxygenation, medication administration, all these other things as well as the laryngoscopy contribute to endotracheal intubation. And then further along, intubation contributes to case management. So we have um, root cause resuscitation as a, a competency, competent as a resuscitationist at, at the paramedic description. And that includes the ability to intubate, which includes the ability to do laryngoscopy, which includes the ability to be a professional and communicate with your team. And so in this way, our model has scaffolded our paramedics so that they're building on these competencies and growing in their competence and using those competencies to the activities that they do. And so competence contributes to an activity, the activity then contributes to a new competence and they grow in competence until we reach a pinnacle threshold for us, which is critical care patient transport. They can manage resuscitation of pediatric patients, adult patients, regardless of the cause, medicine, toxicology, uh, neurological trauma, cardiac, hemodynamics, coagulopathy, um, coagulopathy, all of these things that the critical care paramedic is competent at and can put together in a treatment and a transport is essentially why at the end of this, um, our program, their proficiency gets up to the point where they have that competence of patient extrication and transport, 11.1, .1, which includes all of these competencies. All of these competencies contribute to patient extrication and transport, because as a critical care paramedic, you're not entrusted to do patient extrication and transport until you can demonstrate you can do that on all the patient types that we need it, um, which means that you can demonstrate competency in all of these things and do these particular activities that are associated with the transport. That is probably very complicated, and you might need to watch it again. And absolutely, you're able to call me, uh, email me. We can discuss this. It's not perfect work. We're, we're not perfect, and we're asking for your input on this work so that we can get better, we can get closer to what these things really are. Um, and in the end, hopefully get better patient care more efficiently or as efficiently as possible. So I appreciate you watching this video. I appreciate that it is a lot. Um, I hope the video helps and I hope you can give me feedback on the video and I look forward to your feedback on this uh, work that we've been doing at Orange. Thank you very much.